Welcome everyone to this evening's iteration of Kim Shuck's Poem Jam. Thank you all for coming. Uh, while we're waiting for one or two more people to arrive, I wish to acknowledge our community, maybe mention a couple upcoming events. So on behalf of the San Francisco Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this place, and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and to affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples. September, uh, we have lots of events coming up. Uh, Viva, all sorts of things. You, to learn about our events, you can pick up one of our uh, newsletters on the table over there. Or there's also flyers, also coffee and cookies. Please help yourself to whatever you see. And I think that ends my announcements. I'm going to turn the microphone over to our gracious host, Kim Shuck. Please give a warm welcome to Kim Shuck. I suppose I should really be welcoming you <coughs> since I practically live here. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of cool things coming up with Poem Jam as well. Um, next month, uh, the inimitable Paul Corman Roberts will be taking the role of me because I'm touring a new book called Noodle Rant Tangent, which is a collection of essays, kind of not, it's not new for me to write essays, it's new for me to publish essays. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> so I'm gonna be away for a month. And then when we come back, we have a lot of exciting things to share. So that's pretty exciting. Um, our first reader tonight is E.K. Keith, who is not just a brilliant poet, but also one of my very best friends. And since I've stopped uh, dragging her into things when people cancel, um, <laughs> it's terrible to have people that you know you can count on that way, and then you sort of abuse them a bit. So I've left her alone for a little while, and it's going to be really exciting to see what she has to say about our, tonight's topic, which is body autonomy. I know we've done one other one of this topic. I may do more of them in the new year. It does seem a little urgent to discuss some of that. So for now, if you could please welcome E.K. Keith to this microphone. I think I'm gonna go with this one. So hey, everybody. It's nice to see, uh-oh. That's, well, now I'm gonna have to do something extra special, which is put my earring back on. And because of proprioception, I know where my ear is without looking in a mirror. I know, it's pretty amazing. This is like one of these feats of normal, no, if I can only just get it clipped. There we go, okay, no, yes. Here we go, yeah, all right. Party tricks by poets. <laughs> and if I'm super lucky, the lens won't pop out of my dollar store readers. <laughs> so I am excited to be here. Thank you for asking me to be here, Kim. And thank you everybody from San Francisco Public Library. We appreciate all of the resources that you offer to our information community here in San Francisco. And that's like everybody, just in case you didn't know. Um, so bodily autonomy is a topic at hand. And one of the things that I'd like to just point out is that as a group of people, aside from you know women in the United States, not having bodily autonomy currently. Also in the United States, another group of people who don't have bodily autonomy is children. So think about that for a moment. I was, and so this little poetry journey that I will take you on begins in Texas, where I was born. 
and it's called Lilius Yoga and Me, PBS, mid-1970s. At Linda Sullivan's School of Dance, we wore black leotards with pink tights. Tap shoes had to be black with low heels. Ballet shoes had to be pink with one strap of pink elastic across the instep, no ribbons. I thought these rules were absolute. Then Lilius came on TV after Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and the electric company, a daily ritual. She invited me to do yoga with her on TV. I marveled at her magenta leotard with matching tights. So I stretched my mind and I stood on one foot. Lilius played music like I'd never heard before and I liked slow motion poses with some I even knew from dance school. And I decided when I was big enough to have my own way, I would wear a leotard with matching tights. And I wondered if they came in blue. <laughs> so as we continue this lifelong journey towards bodily autonomy and possibly away from it as well, which is challenging. This is called body shame. My mother put me on a diet at age 10 because my dance teacher said I was too tall and too big already to ever be a ballerina and not done growing yet, so no more toe shoes. The waiting room of our quack pediatrician should have had a cross-stitched sampler that said, Munchausen by Proxy Mother's Club. My mother invoked the dance teacher's authority when she asked the doctor if she could put me on a diet of 1,000 calories a day. He said, that should be okay. I started to hate eggs and meat. Breakfast, one boiled egg, no condiments, one orange, one children's chewable multivitamin. Lunch, one hamburger patty, no condiments, no lettuce, no tomato, no cheese, no bread, no have it your way, just one hamburger patty, plain, one orange. Supper, same as lunch. Apparently, this is a thousand calories. This went on long enough that my teacher learned from my mother of the doctor's approval and my mother enlisted her assistance in monitoring me at lunch. Imagine my mother's satisfaction of buying me a smaller dress than I could fit into. A reward, she said, for when you lose the weight. I'm not sure how long this went on, but starvation diets work. And my mother zipped me into that dress just the once. Diet over. I ate some candy and lunch and supper same as the rest of the family. Of all my mother's tortures, dance class was the one I minded least because twice a week, it was me in control of me. <clears throat> a brief history of a rebellious body in motion. At age 14, I had 10 years of formal dance training committed to muscle memory with no lingering notions of being a ballerina. I quit after making the high school softball team. And everyone said, 
it is such a shame. And I said, why don't you take a dance class? My family was worried because in spite of all the ballet, I wasn't turning out very feminine. My mother said dance class would help me get a rich husband. It did not. Dance class did make me a good dancer. I've collected decades of dance moves, cataloged in muscle memory, with lingering smiles for parties and dance clubs, wedding receptions, not mine of course, political protests and demonstrations, bars and street festivals. But mostly, I like to let my body move in the living room to whatever comes on the radio. And now we're just gonna bring it right up to 2022. This piece is called, and this is my piece that I will leave you with this evening. It's called June 24th, 2022. Except for jaywalking, I haven't committed any crimes. But I woke up on a regular Friday morning without the rights that I had when I went to bed. And my rights weren't removed because of the systemic and racial oppressions of the carceral state. No. Five villainous judges proved that the pen is mighty when guided by the narrow personal views of powerful people who write the law of the land to inflict the problems of the past onto the future and the deaths to come from the lack of health care for 21st century women will be more medieval than death by sword. And I'm feeling especially lucky to wake up in California because state governments now get to decide what I can do with my vagina. And I have a passport full of empty pages, empty promises of United States citizenship as my personhood focuses and fades from state to state. But gas is too expensive for road tripping this summer from California to Texas. And the women in my family say they don't feel oppressed yet, but they'll know when it comes and they're worried. I haven't committed any crimes. So I could fill my passport pages with stamps from countries where I have more rights than the state where I was born because my rights to my body in the country where I was born are gone. And that's the real crime. Thanks everybody. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Kim. So I need to explain a thing to y'all, which is that um, because uh, one of our readers was um, is a is a healthcare worker, she seems to have come down with a really horrible case of COVID. So we're just going to take a moment and hope that she feels better soon. And. I don't know what's up with the other reader. It may have been a miscommunication or something, but I do not see her here. So um, weirdly for this reading, our last reader <laughs> is Sarah Beal. Sarah Beal is part of uh, one of uh, the people who runs Colossus Press, um, has put together a really incredible latest book, which is Colossus Freedom about the carceral state, which is available here tonight. Um, and uh, I have known Sarah as uh, an editor and uh, a person who assembles books for a long time because we met assembling one. But also, she is a remarkable poet and uh, does not read half enough and I am delighted to have her here tonight, Sarah Beal. Thank you, Kim. Thanks. I'm just
fix this. Is that good? Okay. okay. I'm also really excited to read here tonight um, because the first poem I'm going to read is um, actually the first poem in my book that is coming out in February from Finishing Line Press. Ah. Um, and I think a lot of my writing sort of clusters under the theme of bodily autonomy, and particularly around the idea that we have a right to feel safe in our bodies and make choices for our bodies and feel safe in our choices. So this first piece is called Prescribed Burn. It began in a mix of soil and salt, a fire set in my stillness. I don't like to think about the windows shattered, the poison I pushed downstream. Most of me came home, came awake, lips bruised in a crush of fear, skull sore from collisions and silent sobs. My hair knotted and torn, a messy convenience in his furious grip, a handle to twist and drag, me stumbling, dumb, shuffled in disbelief from block to block. The next morning, miraculously alone, I slid into the stained bus seat, tears tucked in the tire spin, breathed fully for the first time in far too long. My bitter tongue, swollen with unnamed crimes, dates and times, deceptions and dares, lines drawn and crossed, left choking on the curb. My blood gathered against my skin, strained all the places his fingers gripped, blooming badges of dishonor, I wrenched free slipped his mother's ring off my cold finger, couldn't watch as it bounced in the roadside gravel. Sometimes a door needs to slam before it can close. Sometimes they burn fields so something new might grow. Um, the next poem um, is called, I Wanna Give Him a Chance. Her voice is thin, scrapes and rolls, a dry leaf across the sidewalk. My fingers grip the phone, heart, a bird in my throat. He said he loves me, she says. I want to give him a chance. Her thoughts, a murmuration, hope and fear lost together. My fingers grip the phone, heart, a bird in my throat. The sun ducks behind the, behind the cover of the sinking city. He said he loves me, her voice, a startled hover against gravity. Quiet rolls down the window. A few drops of rain vein the dust. From the cover of the city, the sun sinks her teeth into the core of the day. Just in case, she says, I have pictures. I could put him away, but I won't. The bruise rolls down her throat. A few drops of blood settle under her skin. Today, the moon is a whiter version of herself, floats like a scar on the horizon. Just in case, I say, you could have a plan, some place to go, but she won't. Our silence sits on the wire, fingers fisted. Small offerings are all we can give. Today, she floats a fainter version of herself, guilt scarlet on her horizon. Regret is so familiar, it crumbles fits along the curve of her shoulders. Our silences sit on the wire, fingers fisted, small offerings are all we can give. A wide-eyed, breathless fledgling hops awkwardly across the concrete. I want to give him a chance, she said. I could put him away, but I won't. Our words weave into the hush of rain, car sounds, and someone yelling. On the crowded concrete, the fledgling has been knocked into the swollen gutter. He says he loves me, her breath stiff, her words pulled from bitten lips like a wishbone. In the rain, someone is still yelling. The hush of the cars loses our words. I think I'll give him a chance. Somewhere a heart grips a bird, twists its throat. He loves me, she says, breath stiff, a wish bitten from a shard of bone. Her voice is thin, scrapes and rolls, a dry leaf across the sidewalk. He says he loves me. I want to give him a chance. Um, I think one of the things, um, there's so many 
terrible things that have come out of the end of Roe. But one of the things that I think is interesting and possibly good is that I feel like people are now talking about their family members who have needed to end pregnancies. And I think there's a lot of power in storytelling and a lot of power to create change. And so this next poem is sort of about that and about talking to each other, telling. The winter sunset seeps crimson behind the mountains. She cups her secret into my ear, a match to my mother's. Grief and anger pressed fingers to palm, a string of stories, laundry on a line, wavering. A tentative sovereignty born in blood, each story has a name, Rita, Marguerite, Amy, Joan. My mother tells me her story, surrounded by snow, the early darkness of a northern night. Our words hang on the phone line, cold and stiff. It should be easier now. I want to see you afterwards. She told of driving with friends, Hollywood to Tijuana, a girl's weekend summer of 63, smoking cigarettes with the top down, sun and wind, a flask to pass around the car. Someone knew someone who had a doctor's name. It would be all right. Later, in a dirty motel room, she cramped so hard she passed out, vomiting and bleeding through gray sheets. She tried not to cry too loud, listened to her friends dance in the courtyard bar outside the window, their laughter bleeding into the scratchy radio music, her fear already scarring, curling into silence. I listened to the squeaky crunch of tires on the snowy parking lot. Dawn blinks out with the street lights. Almost strangers, our eyes roam the windshield, looking for instructions in the ice left on the wipers. Our teeth and hands hold us carefully in our own skins. We are tangled, breathless in our unintended bonding, awkward in the intimacy of this accident. Cloudy breath floats away from us. In these strained moments, time spreads, thins at its edges. There's no guilt at this undoing. He stamps his feet to keep warm. Even in the orbit of his honor, I live these hours alone. In the room, I pull away from him, but let him keep my hand. Palm upturned, a place to put his thumb, a way to feel effective. I try not to squeeze too hard in the clenching suck of being wrung out. That afternoon, and through this whole slow husk of winter, we wandered in a pantomime of coupled gestures. Some secrets don't age, they calcify. Breathe quietly, hands folded, lay claim with flat little smiles. My secret, natural as a stretch mark, lingers. Mirrored in the eyes of older ladies, blooms with this telling, precarious and commonplace, rose-colored mornings after storm-filled nights. Very, when I was about 22, I had a job working in Colorado, going door to door, um, doing public education and getting funds for um, a nonprofit that was supporting um, choice in the state of Colorado right after, I think it was the Webster decision that let um, states have some more control over how and when people terminated pregnancies. and. In that job, I heard so many people's stories of relatives who had died as a result of terminating pregnancies before it was legal and safe. And I always remembered all of those stories. So um, my next poem is titled Turning to Salt. He won't give you an answer. He wants you to hold his words on your tongue, make them a bed. Sew them into your hem, their weight sluggish, suffocation at the end of every step. He tells you, don't look. A backwards glance is sin's first twinge, a crescent ripe for waxing. He tells you, the past doesn't matter, but it's the wave that brought you to this precarious morning, a wave that has already started to forget the warm sun of your skin. He doesn't know. Your soft organs already venture out. Your feral heart has run barefoot. Wind a tangled dare, a promise kissed behind your ear. 
Your body matches the sea, salt for salt. Wakes when the moon rolls over in bed to spill a tearful greeting in this wretched dawn. Why not choose the world? It's here, pressed under your nails, clings to you at every opportunity, familiarity deep as breath. You won't be disappointed. Look close. There's innocence in the spread of pale roots, possibility in the far-flung sigh of a train as it rushes to the heart of a summer night. This is where you've always been going. Words like rain. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to slip along, to slide your hand in gravities and grin as you fall. This next poem is a really new one, and it there's an interesting thing about it which I'd love like your thoughts on. Um, the person that this poem is written about uses they them pronouns, and so I have used they them pronouns in this poem, and they are a single person. So, still, they fall. This cold world turns their body to rock. They break apart on the way down, hand, throat, rib cage. Their voice fades in and out, a numb welcome, a sinking sensation, like the skipping silence at the end of a record, a crackle in the absence of song. They haven't remembered. Their heart is not nailed to the floor, not quite carrying, not just yet. Thank you. This is titled Next Time. Clouds crouch, warring cats between bunched mountains. The road, shadow slick, climbs in switches, dives and sways, dances lonely to the truck's exhausted growl. My thoughts stretch, a clothesline hung with my mistakes. His anger pricks the tender cusp of my fear. He says he knows me, maybe better than I do. I stare past the mud-spattered windows, watch the feckled green and constant grays, the torn sky too cold for rain. I find surprises in the bleak predictability of the late November highway. Half a naked bed frame, caught mid-tumble, clings to the rumpled slope. We pass a gas station, roof caved in, barren vines twist, reach out, broken windows caress the twilight. I curl against the door, cradle a vicious itch, regret that refuses the satisfaction of my nails. I cool my bruised eye on the frozen window, let my nose run onto my sleeves, reach for the grounding scent of laundry soap, the gentle flannel still holds the chemical mockery of spring. My landslide mind scrambles for that perfume, the ghost of an anonymous laundromat, a hideaway from his cigarettes and day after beer sweat. With the groan of gears, something small inside me rattles loose. It makes a broken sound into the silence. I force my breath even, write promises in the window's condensation, next time. There will be a next time. Next time this road curves back into a shadow. My heart contracts. His apology will spit glistening and slide with other fast food containers on the rusting truck floor. Next time, the occasional moon shrugs, looks at her watch, and sighs. Um, one of the things I think about when I think about uh, body autonomy is that all of these things, whether or not to have a child, wh who to marry, who to love, who to create family with, are all so important that they have to be chosen because they're too hard and require some sacrifice and so much sort of working things out and giving up the things that you want sometimes that you have to choose this. And so thinking about that, um, I decided to read um, this poem that I wrote right after I had my oldest daughter. 
So this is a pretty old poem, so she's almost 30. So, um, but I wrote this thinking about her the morning after she was born. So, Bean, for my daughter, Iris. We are steeped in quiet, folded in sheets and blankets, and you, small Bean, so complete in your sleep, your pink hat pulled to meet your downy eyebrows, breathe in the even light of dawn. Your first morning is outside. Today, the world is broken open, and every cell sings. So for my last poem, it, um, I'm going to have some help from some of my friends. So, um, and um, we haven't gotten to practice this much, but we're going to go for it. It's called Unborn. Unwanted, unlucky, unwed, unknotted, unscripted, unsaid, unburdened, unbidden, unbrushed, unburied, unbroken, unjust, unfolded, unfinished, unmade, unlawful, unprolanced, unpaid, unblemished, unaltered, unarmed, unbuckled, unbridled, unharmed, unbounded, unbuttoned, undone, unspoken, unwoken, unwon, Uncommon, unstable, undressed, uncertain, unquiet, unrest, unwelcome, uncivil, unsaid, unlikely, uncommon, unread, unending, unable, untold, unopened, unsettled, unsold, unscripted, unrivaled, unwon, unbitten, unblemished, unborn, unseemly, unkind, uncoiled, untitled, unsigned, unspoiled. Thank you both. Ah, wonderful. Ali Jones is one of my favorite poets. And um, I've had the great privilege of working with her in a number of different contexts, both as co-readers, as somebody who's booked her to read, as somebody who's helped, uh, been part of a collaboration to curate things. Um, but my very favorite way to interact with Ali is to listen to her read. So if you could please welcome Allie Jones to this microphone. Oh, either one? OK. This one is looking kind of short. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come up, but that one's easier. OK, yeah, this one. Y'all can hear me OK? OK, we're going to go with this. Um, and I have a place for my papers, so it works. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. I'm so excited to be here. Um, this subject of body autonomy, I, I really thought about it in a lot of different ways. And my pieces don't directly speak to body in the way of, of like cellular memory, but um, it looks at sense memory. And for me, that in the body is really important, especially um, thinking about what we know and what we don't know. I don't want to remember my life before mermaids. I was raised by saltwater queens, blessed by magical beings of mythic proportions, daughters of Yemeya and Gumbo, those who remind me of the beautiful resilience that lives within us, coiled crowns adorned with cowrie, goddesses who maintain the grace of a gazelle with the ever-changing tides, mes sirens, my mermaid queens, flowing, crashing, rising, my grandma Genevieve, Cayenne pepper royalty, celestial matriarch soft yet steady as a metronome in the kitchen with a laugh that could brighten any dim room. Unafraid of what is to come because her love was founded in certainty. Her setbacks created the beginning of her greatest comebacks, flowing through the roughest currents and remaining strong, flowing, crashing, rising. Mother Teresa, 
calming like rosemary and gentle as gardenia's earth warrior who taught me to respect and protect all forms of life. Holding space for her softness and her offspring unconditionally magical. Conjuring potions that transformed the flu into a slight sniffle or inventing the perfect bedtime story she grew in the midst of adversity. Never allowing fear or judgment to stop her pursuit. Crashing against every judgment with expectations and with determination. Flowing, crashing, rising. Mesigan, my mermaid queens. Cousins that always remind me that I could do anything. Sisters that challenge me to seek softness in times of pain and trauma, to look at myself in a mirror untarnished by self-loathing. My aquatic angels who kept me sane when all I thought I could ever be was crazy. Loving with our hearts wide open, guided by our gut feelings and our star signs, Rever, Quayon, Amon, et Guerrier. Dreamers, believers, lovers, and warriors, rising above black holes of doubt, insecurities, and fear, flowing, crashing, rising. So this next piece, oh, thank you. <laughs> So this, this next piece um, is, honor, is in honor of my grandma Genevieve. Uh, she passed away in 2019, and I actually wrote this piece seven days before she passed. Um, and the last few years of her life, um, one, she was paralyzed on her left side, and two, she was experiencing Alzheimer's. And so by the time she passed, she had actually forgotten who most of us were. La plupart de ma cœur, elle est... Elle était, elle est toujours la plupart de ma cœur, la plupart de ma vie, ma cœur, me. I'm grateful for my grandma Genevieve, a daughter of Louisiana sharecroppers, no middle name, several last names, five daughters, one in heaven, lost in a trance, ready to dance, the best cook in our family. She was young, wild, and free before it was a thing to be. Dedicated to her family, laughing uncontrollably, cleaning houses every day, 40 years just to make a way for us. No limits to her love. She drew energy from above, so below we were able to grow, flow, go. She taught me to appreciate everything. Never bought cars or bling, garden plots and recipes. The very best of me. She taught me how to love, feel, and heal. There will never be another quite like my mother's mother. There will never be enough words dans tous les langues to describe her magnanimous presence, the essence of love and light. We will be all right. Even on the darkest days, she found a way. I was there the day her life changed. All of her plans rearranged on the bedroom floor. La plupart de ma cœur, elle est, elle était, elle est toujours la plupart de ma cœur. Okay. So this next piece is um, in English and Spanish. That last one is English and French. I, I realize when I do this, I like to tell people so they're not like, where did we just go? Uh, <laughs> I want you to go on the trip with me. El arco iris mi corazón. No necesito una razón, sin duda y miedo, yo soy lo que espero. Como agua, soy tranquila y poderosa, lo que pienso viene aquí. Mis sueños pasan enfrente de mí, con un voz más fuerte que algún grito, gracias y amor a mis corazones aquí en la tierra y en el cielo. The rainbow of my heart waves of gratitude, a journey within and without, releasing every single fear and doubt not allowing the, my anxious energy to disrupt my flow. This is the art of letting go of who I've been or had to be. My soul is being set free. Letting me know this place is home, free to play and laugh and roam, rejoicing at the colors converging from light to dark. Once I know I create the situation, I'll defy every spatial limitation, sending love and light to all the dark places, filling my heart with familiar faces. I am bountiful, I am beautiful, 
I am more than enough. I have more than enough. I am more than enough. As it is written, so it shall be. I know Yemeya will watch over me. She is the mother of the water and I am the child of the sea. The strongest currents will not surpass me. Flowing with every obstacle in my path, I know that pain and struggle will not last. Sin duda y miedo, yo soy lo que espero. Thank you. Okay. So I, I do a lot of pieces like around grief and how I just processing grief and I think about how grief manifests in the body um, and how we don't let it manifest in the body sometimes, how we just keep going. Um, and this piece was in response to a lot of, a lot of grief, a lot of folks uh, close to me that were passing and I didn't really have the words for it, but the page did. And Dalibi. When a sparrow cries, a soul flies silently in the greenest pastures over warm rays beaming. Hummingbirds stand still in observance, in reverence for the stars who no longer burn with a light that never fades. Generational grief in my bones, hope that frays, dismembered memory, unspoken knowing in my hair, we say so much more shouting wild, vision blurred, the simulations tilting, the matrix shifting, artifacts shrill of sacrifice, cloudy countenance, regret creeps up your eardrum, steady and resounding, white noise tingles straight to the temporal lobe. I hope you dance and sing les chansons de joie et amour profond. Pas de souci, pas de larmes, rien qu'une souris qui allume. J'espère que tu vas bien, même si vous ne savez pas comment. Thank you. Okay. And this is my last piece. Uh, and it is called Black Girl Soldier. This piece I wrote in honor of black women going through a silent struggle that folks don't always talk about, of depression, of... PTSD of traumas that we'll never know, um, and really honoring that and holding space for that. Our first general was underground. Railroads couldn't compare to the depths of her mind on a mission with a vision, precision, in the darkest cave covered by branches, branches isolated by shame no matter where we go uprooted black bodies. We continue to hide how we feel inside. Not equal, not well. What is being? The blood that drops, my heart that stops beating, emotions and strength from this black vessel, gasping for air, craving help, someone to care, anyone to see that I'm not invincible. Sold and conditioned. Hanging on by a noose with no room to break loose from the labels you didn't ask for. Martyr complex. Struggling to catch your breath under waters of expectation, bury your pain to survive. They can't relate. Dissociate. Nuclear fractures. Familial disasters armed with silence. Surrounded by never-ending violence. Haven't we had enough? faking like we're fine, struggling in pride, told to hide our wounds inside, self-inflicted crimes, the deepest roots. Admiral abolitionist writer, wells of information filled her books on a crusade for justice, fighting to resist before a balled up fist. Truth of liberation, asphyxiation. We are the seeds from strange fruit. Lemon, lemon trees in the summer breeze hemorrhaging from the root. Under leaves of ignorance, our minds assassinated, our souls kidnapped, our bodies raped. There is no escape from the scars, this skin. When can we begin to heal, 
to feel, to just be free. In the cage where birds wish to sing, Harriet, Ida, Billy, Nina, shape-shifting trauma into triumph. Gardenias bloom across the street, cope or heal. Ultimately, it's all about how you deal. The deepest roots hold the darkest storms. Thank you. So yeah, I think we're going to return to the subject of body autonomy in the new year. We've got a couple of other themes, but I wanted to take this moment to thank the San Francisco Public Library. And um, in a time when people are taking weapons into libraries and threatening damage and enacting damage and uh, interrupting story time with people if they don't agree with their proper assessment of who they are and how they want to be in the world. I am really grateful that San Francisco has a powerful public library. I don't agree with every single thing that happens in these walls, but I always agree with some of it. And I'm grateful at this wealth of information that is made available to me by this place. So thank you, John. Thank you, AV department. Thank you to all of our poets, E.K. Keith, Sarah Beale, Allie Jones, and also to Kimi Sugioka, who pitched in to um, read one of Sarah's pieces, who uh, is, is also the, the Alameda Poet Laureate, by the way, so that's not nothing. And uh, I won't be here next time, but I will see you in November when we'll be celebrating the release of a new book that I did collaboratively with Lisa Ruth Elliott. I rarely take these moments to celebrate myself, but you know what? Maybe sometimes that's okay. Thank you for being here with us. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.